I am Kenny. I'm coming from Databend AI, a building pipeline since 2004. I'm doing that in Intel, Israeli Defense Forces, different ETA companies, Oracle Data Cloud. I'm CTO and co-founder of Databend, uh, uh, helping data engineering teams ensure reliable delivery of quality data with a purpose-built monitoring system. Uh, and I'm a huge fan of Airflow, uh, scheduling performance improvements, uh, then we get together with Polydia team, AP31, debug executor, and I think much more to come, right? So, and I like to solve complex pro problems that I see on the picture. So let's start to talk about problems and solutions. So this is the way I personally see the data project when I start to work on it. It looks very streamlined. It looks like, you know, very promising. Everything's going to work. Everything is great. But then actually reality is come. So I'm sure your pipeline doesn't look like this picture. Oh, okay. I'm sure like, you know, your pipeline doesn't look like this picture. Uh, but I think there are a lot of analogies between what we have in the real project and what we see here. There are multiple tools inside our pipelines. There are multiple versions of that tools. There are multiple pipelines with a lot of you know, owners and pipelines are changing. So, and let's discuss it. And we have a code changes for the eggs and operators and the payloads. We have data changes, quality, schema, availability of the data. And like everything changes. Right now, we change, like, are changes inside the libraries, uh, Python 2 to Python 3, uh, COVID-19. So everything is unstable and things starts to fail, right? And the moment things start to fail, this is how I see myself <laughs> when, when it happens. It usually happens on Friday, like so on Wednesday, pipeline is okay, Thursday pipeline is okay. And the moment I go out from my work, like in the, in, in the late hours, I check the dashboard and I see, oh, this pipeline is failing, right? So then it takes hours to identify the real problem and it takes even more time to understand the side effect of this. Uh, what happens in downstream decks, what happens in downstream operators, how can I fix that and what I need to do. So as an engineer, I like, I like my job and I want to be happy at my job, right? So this is the pyramid of needs of the data ops of data engineer of myself. And I won't really get to the top of this, py of, of this pyramid to do more proactive engineering and does no response on failures, to do more development, to be much more productive. So let us review it together. A, so usually when you start the product, you, uh, project, you start from just making pipeline run end to end. And it may, sometimes it takes time, sometimes one day, sometimes it, uh, it weeks. But finally you have your pipeline green, you, starting to say, yeah, pipeline runs okay, pipeline execution is good. You're sending the mail to the teams and guys, they have a new pipeline in production, everything is great. And then a few days you got mail back and said, guys, actually your pipeline is late on the delivery. So pipeline latency is bad. It takes too much time to create all this data. Performance is not that good. So you start to dig inside this performance and at some point of time, performance is okay. You can deliver the data. So you deliver the data to the first client. We deliver data for the first client, and then you got another mail or Slack message, or there's no <coughs> a hi from your boss. It says, guys, pipeline is great, performance is great, the data that you produce is not good. So it's all about data sanity, right? So I write some checks, I make sure that my pipeline right now produces really good data, and I start to run it. I deliver data for, to one client, to one partner, to one customer. And then more customers are coming, more cases I need, to, I, need, I need to solve, more data inputs, more models in the same part of the pipeline. And I start to lose what happened, I start to lose what happened inside my pipeline. So I start to implement data trends. At the moment I have all of this, I have data trends, I have data sanity, I have pipeline latency, I have pipeline execution visibility, and a good execution, I can actually achieve awareness of all stakeholders inside my team, inside teams that I work with, that people know what's happening, people ex 
know what to expect. People kind of expect a good quality results and they can help me work on my pipe. So my point during this presentation kind of get to the awareness of that execution data pipelines, okay? So we want to build this pyramid. And I think the, 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 most, you know, the most important thing for me inside this pyramid is to have here the observability. So let's talk about it. So first of all, I would say thank you, Airfall. It's a great tool. It's a, you have you know, a really nice UI and a, it's, it didn't change a lot since you know, five, six years ago, but it's, you know, it's so good. It provides your visibility on the execution. It provides the visibility what's happening with your, what's happening with your execution, retries, trend on the execution. You can see the latency, so you can identify the bottlenecks. It's good. But then you start to work with it and you understand that you need to move up inside your pyramid and it takes extra steps. So let's discuss these extra steps. <laughs> Chapter one, you install the airflow, uh, you start to run it. So first thing you do as a production engineer, you want to understand the platform. You want to treat your airflow deployment as a service, right? So you connect metrics to Grafana, Kibana, you connect logging to Logly, Logzo, or any other system. You connect production alerting to your service. So you have Zabbix, Datadog, Nagios, PagerDuty, Grafana alerts, whatever you have. And now you have a good visibility on CPU, on memory, on everything else inside that service. So Airflow becomes 24 seven service that you can actually use and it's really nice, right? So don't forget to turn on StatsD from the Airflow so you can see like, you know, much more interesting metrics from the scheduler, from workers, and then you can also connect your salary, Kubernetes, nodes. You start to bring in all Airflow clusters, but you have, you have a good visibility on the service. The thing is that Airflow is a service, but the jobs inside that service are not. They jobs, they start to run like, you know, 1 a.m. at night, they finish in 15 minutes, and they start to run again in one day. Or maybe there is going to be some retry or maybe somebody is going to rerun this job manually. So it's not the real service that runs 24-7. <coughs> there are jobs inside the system that doesn't behave like a service. So I are still using Grafana for Airflow job data, and it's created some problems. Let's just take a look on one of them. Uh, let's assume I connected all my jobs metrics to Grafana. I'm using Grafana with Influx. So now I want to use this system to prioritize my day-to-day -day work. And depending on these priorities, I might spend time on this pipeline or completely another pipeline, okay? So let's take a look on the, <coughs> on the left part of the slide. What we have here is a dashboard, a graph from Grafana that represents five different decks Auto big, auto lab, mighty peaks, zero off. They do some ingestion on the data. From what can I, from what I see here, I start to identify the problem and I say, okay, there is some pipeline which were running usually eight minutes and now it runs for, uh, 42 minutes, right? And then it happens on the 3rd of July. So I definitely don't want to spend over time on my work on the 4th of July and I start to fix it. But if I take a closer look on this one, and, by, and then we'll do it by splitting this information into more graphs, I can find out that actually my P didn't run 40 minutes. It was restarted five times. And then actually, then I remove this information from the graph, I start to understand that completely different deck was the problematic one and can cause a lot of issues. And here, this is the thing. Probably it's really hard to see the latest data inside the Grafana plus info because it's a time series. And I really want to see on the graph number four, the information from the latest successful attempt of the job. So the moment I see that, I can definitely see that there is a job that is called zero off, but taking eight minutes in the beginning of the week, and it's growing really, really fast. And now it takes 
I think 21 minutes at the end of the week. So probably next week it's going to take even more. And this will affect downstream decks. This will affect my models. This will affect my reports, my databases. And this is actually something that I should take in care before so the real problem will come. So lesson learned. First of all, what can we do? We can report important metrics at the end of the DAC, kind of creating a report on important stuff that happened inside the deck. We can start to use custom dashboards. I think uh, part of us remember Airflow once had a really nice SQL query pay uh, uh, SQL query page where you can run the right different queries and run them on top of Airflow database. I think you know, this one was a kind of a prototype for Superset. It became later pre, uh, pre preset, really great tool, but it was there for the for some purpose. We really wanted to see what's happening with our jobs, and we really want to connect all the pieces of information inside that SQL query a view and see all jobs less than as a time series, but more as a report. Okay, so I can see all my I can own all my jobs that take too much time, all my attempts, all this stuff. So this is something that's really important that we, do, that we cannot like, you know, be dependent on Grafana only. We have to do some extra work to bring all this information together. So then I have some visibility on operational and then I start to think what actually I'm running, right? So we have service that runs Decks that run some payload. And with the time, this payload starts to be a very complicated payload. People start to bring in different training processes, <coughs> very complex ingest processes. We start to bring in a lot of oh, really interesting payloads, and we need some visibility on them as well. So here, I would like to be more data scientist than a data engineer. I try to treat this as per per operators as an experiment. I would like to connect maybe external system to that experiment to do some experimentation management. So where I'm MLflow, Sakal, SageMaker, many, many others, commercial and non-commercial tools that can provide me more visibility on what's happening inside my payload. I will start to encapsulate reporting inside my notebooks that I got from my data scientist or my some data analysts. And this way we'll start to get data quality information, model quality information, business KPI, and here it's going to be a good question to ask. So maybe I would achieve that awareness. I can just know, stop here and continue. And I think uh, there are much more work to do. Take a look on this picture. Some of this information coming from the model training process. So it's R2 of that specific model. And some information coming from data ingest. So right now, when I'm taking a look on the model R2, it's a... Uh, Nice graph, no, it's, so it looks random, but it's not. The moment I connect this graph from one deck that trains the model to another deck that ingests the data, I can see the real trend here. So take a look on the graph in the bottom of the screen right now. I can see then my, the input size have a really good effect on the quality of the model. So now I can say to my machine learning guys that the quality of the model wasn't improved by the bad algorithm, maybe, but it actually was improved because we bring, we, you know, we got more data from our partner, from our systems, from, from, from somewhere. Yeah, and here, what I learned so far, it's really important to make sure that metrics that people use inside payloads are available to that engineer who runs Airflow. We want this visibility. It's also very important to get metrics from the airflow itself to the guy who runs, uh, who owns the payload, so he knows what happening, what happens with his job, like how much memory, CPU, data inputs coming into the into his payload, and how much data coming out of his payload. So this is like integrating metric system into orchestration system that can be used by both roles, and again SQL approach role uh, SQL approach here really can help because there are a lot of entities here, experiments, jobs, 
operators <coughs> retries and we can definitely benefiting benefit from joining all this information so let's move forward and here is chapter three so we got all these metrics we got all this visibility into the process and we can you know, i already start to feel really comfortable running pipelines like this but at the same time number of pipelines grows with the time people get used to airflow now we have seen a lot of presentations during this uh, summit that there are organizations that have 1000 of that 100 of that that's it move a lot of operators so there is no way for us to be able to oversee all these trends all these metrics manually we need a system that will be able to see the change inside these metrics and alert on them. So here, I know, this is a really important thing. We always postpone, I always postponed, again, when I was a few years ago, connection between my data pipeline to the alerting system to the end. I was trying to make pipeline work, to make sure the pipeline works. I was trying to make sure that pipeline will produce good result. And then only after a few, few months, I was connecting the pipeline to the alerting system. Now I think differently. I think it's really great to connect your pipelines as soon as possible to alerting system that you have. It's really great to get visibility of what's happening on your, with your pipelines in Slack channels, in pager duty, in any kind of alerting system that we, that, we, that we use. It's really great to treat your pipelines as a production backend. So it looks, it sounds reasonable. So where is the problem, right? <laughs> there is always a small problem that we do the, the, this stuff. Regular you know, the pipelines, they are jobs, they are operators. And back to our discussion about services, pipelines doesn't behave as a services. And most of the alerting system that we have right now available, treat everything as a service. As node, as maybe a network device, as a phone, but it's less about cron, job, operator. So <coughs> it will take some effort to bring our data into the alerting system we have. It's also about being able to see all these alerts together with the execution information that we have. Usually, people don't have inside organization 100 microservices, but we have 100 DAGs to transfer the airflow. So I really want to have all this information in one place. And let's discuss why, why, why it's important. If I take a look on the data pipelines with runs, a part of them affect, you know, part of them don't override results created by previous pipelines. A lot of them actually create new partitions, new tables, new models all the time. So then I have a regular alert system and I connect my job to the regular alert system my job will become green again the moment i have one successful run this is the way all our services behave when i have a service down i see it's a red one i oh, i have an alert the moment service is back again alert is gone but it's not true for dex take a look on the deck dex uh, execution information on the left coming from the airflow you can see that one deck, like a one deck a few weeks ago, has failed. And now my alerting system can say to me, no, everything is okay. But it's actually not. Probably right now I'm missing one partition, and that partition can affect my models, reports, everything else. And I really want to rerun it. So my alerting system should be aware of all partitions that I'm producing, and alert should stay on until all jobs are green. So what worked for us? First of all, a lot of engineering. 
a, a lot of good practices of alerting. So we, it's still like, you know, still what we know from regular services works in our days as well. So <coughs> if alert doesn't have a proper response plan, it's kind of useless. So I really want to be able to make alert from a lot of metrics that I have, but at the same time, I don't want to be overloaded with alerts coming from every and every DAC execution. I really want to have an alert that represents some real failure and I actually know what needs to be fixed in order to make this alert done. It's proper alert lifecycle definitions we discussed in the, uh, on the previous slide. And then maintaining a system of record, it means keeping list of all happened alerts. So the moment something, the failure, something doesn't, behave, doesn't behave as expected, we can find the source of that problem. We can see that my report was based on some partition that actually failed two weeks ago. And again, stable KPIs for business logic. So if you have alerts, you better have alerts based on KPIs. And it takes a lot of time to create a really stable KPIs so we can use them inside our alerting system. So let's take it to the next level, right? So we have this nice thing. We know what happened inside the execution. We know what happened inside the payload. We combined all this information. We created a lot of metrics. And we defined a really good alerting system. And now I can feel comfortable. I know that my pipeline runs and everything is okay. And I still think that there are a lot of things to be done. First of all, custom operators. I think this is the strength of the airflow. Airflow architecture, airflow design includes separation between hooks and operators. So it's already have a lot of logic extracted from the operator into the hook. So the moment your organization, my organization from, from what I have, I have experienced, the moment we started to have a, some custom stack that use very specific technology or have very specific data lake or have very specific data coming in, we were able to implement custom operators that still use original hooks, but at the same time that these operators could provide much better visibility on what's happening inside. It's really great to start to implement a lot of validation operators so people can just use them inside their decks. It's really great to have a good data visibility. So we like you know, a lot of talks during these two weeks were about how we run Airflow and how we execute DAX. And some of them actually cover the thing that all these DAX are executed in, for only one purpose, to move data from one place to another. So if you have system that runs the execution, but we don't have a good visibility on what's happening on the real product of that system, if you don't have a data visibility, we are partially blind. So it's all about data, data, and data. And data itself, data, raw data is no, it's hard to observe. So it's all about metrics, metrics, and metrics on the data that you have. So we should measure everything. A, I will take, no, I really want to provide one, one dashboard, one graph that I really like to use all the time. I think there are a lot of reasons for failure inside production pipeline, but most of them coming uh, from outside. Our data is constantly changing and we need a really good report on data coming into my deck. So being able to show input size of the data coming inside my deck can solve already a lot of problems. So this is the first step to to, to, to do as a custom operator or as a validation operator to start validate data that coming that comes in into our system. And then we definitely should collect metrics from the Spark job, from the TensorFlow job, from any other job. It's not a black box, so we better have a, as much as possible information inside our system so we can actually do, you know, make a good decision when something fails. So build a system of record, build a comparison methodology. The last one I really want to, uh, to, 
to, to talk about it because right now we talk about a lot of metrics. We talk about a lot of you know, inputs, outputs, parameters of the jobs, system, tools. So we can always build the trend graph. But what about us being able to compare one job to another to find the root cause of the failure? So we are almost in Q&A slide, so I encourage you to ask questions right now because it will take two minutes uh, before we see your question. Uh, so guys, if you have a question, ask it. If you want to share your experience uh, about observability, I will be happy to, uh, to, 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 read, to read your experience you know, and kind of, kind of resonate on what you have done. Uh, so ask your questions now. It's a good time. There's a button the bottom of the screen. Uh, so what did we discuss? What we did discuss? What, what uh, we have discussed so far? First of all, data pipelines are the huge engineering investment. It takes a lot of time to develop a really good quality data pipeline and the node. And then we need a monitor to be able to monitor multiple levels of the system that we are running. It's Airflow, it's the Airflow cluster, it's Kubernetes, it's the pod, and it's what we have inside pod and what we have inside the data produced by that pod. And then also we covered, we started to cover that the monitoring and alerting of data pipelines is a new challenge. It's really hard just to do it by people who do not, who, who, you know, who not running data pipelines themselves. So this is something that we also have to care ourselves, making, making sure that our DevOps team have a good tools for us to run, to use, to alert our pipelines. What we didn't discuss, uh, how to reduce production observability in development and vice versa. I think all this observability we're talking about starts not only in production, it starts way before. We definitely need to have a way to be able to have the same level of observability when we develop our pipelines, when machine learning guys, data analysts, data analysts or like any other developer develop a new payload for the pipeline. So it's a good topic to discuss. It's a big topic to discuss. Then effective CI CD through observability. So right now we cover the production. We can apply the same technique on CI CD. It's very similar. But at the same time, how can we put all this knowledge into our nightly jobs, into our regressions, into our unit tests? It's an interesting topic. And now my favorite one is like a write KPIs for data pipelines. Data pipelines is a, something important in all what all we do. So being able to define a proper KPI on the data quality, on the data products we create, is a really big know-how which should be discussed in a separate lecture and I think uh, on separate talk, a separate meetup. So I really would like to join one like like, like this. Of, uh, in the coming meetups uh, or next Airflow Summit, or I hope I will, I will be able to do it myself. Uh, cool. So, first, like some references uh, Airflow Apache Org is a great resource to, uh, to, to, to go to and to learn more. Uh, take a look on a lot of new AIPs happening inside Airflow. Uh, I encourage you to contribute to. Well, to help make Airflow a better tool. Uh, there is late, the late was developed, AP31 was developed with uh, Thomas from Polydia and from, with uh, Gerald from Twitter. Uh, actually, Gerald has a really great talk about AP31, so you can find it in the recorded sessions. Go and see it. It talks about nice functional programming inside Airflow, but it also talks about how can we make our decks more data aware decks. And then there is a blog, uh, when there's a medium uh, by Maxim, uh, a, a really good material to think about. And there is also our GitHub. So we have a lot of ideas done inside our repository and we're trying to move them into the into Airflow itself. Uh, so I think it's a uh, time for Q&A. <laughs> Thank you.
Good. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Evgeny, for, uh, for that insightful uh, talk. And it looks like we have already uh, some questions that, uh, and you are coming. So let's start. Let's go ahead and, and, and ask them. So first question, do you think Airflow should support Prometheus met metrics natively instead of statically? <laughs> Um, good, great question. First of all, uh, right now Spark 3 has been released and it's already have Prometheus metrics built in. Mm -hmm. So uh, it looks like everybody standardized on Prometheus metrics. It's you are still the Python world. So bringing another library inside standard package, you know, something to think about. Uh, but we definitely should move to the metrics 2.0. So stats the something a key value. And I see by moving to some more advanced system, that they have to put some more labels on the day, <coughs> on, uh, on 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 the metrics. It's going we're going to benefit a lot. And also, I have seen a lot of medium port around how people connect Prometheus to Airflow and how actually the people connect Prometheus to the jobs who runs Airflow. So it's definitely something very interesting to do and. My personal opinion, I'll be happy to have it inside the airport. Okay, good. Uh, great. Uh, the next question is like, what software tools are best suited for getting visibility over DAX and data quality? Yeah, uh, yeah, it's a good, it's a good question because here I will do a shameless promotion uh, of my <laughs> Yeah, so there is data in the eye. Uh, I think you are going to be others uh, soon. So this is what we are focusing inside, you know, as a as that as, as a as a company as a product. We we really like exploring this space. Uh, so first of all, like you know, you can use data on the AI. Uh, yeah, you can contact us on the website. And at the same time, you can already achieve a lot of visibility by doing it yourself. So. As you see from my presentation, a lot of stuff you can do yourself. You can start to instrument your code. You can start to push more metrics. And at some point of time, it's definitely a good time for some external tool to, to use. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, did we experience any kind of auto healing? Yeah. A, a, it's a good question. It's like a, I assume you're asking about uh, you're asking about airflow, right? So, <laughs> uh, so let's talk about it. Uh, we have a retry mechanism inside airflow. It's good. It's working great. At the same time, it requires some features like you know being able to respond differently on different exit codes, mm -hmm. uh, especially in Kubernetes, right? Kubernetes behaves differently and pods failing for different reasons. So you don't want dust to run multiple times your pod because it has a problem inside it. At the same time, you definitely want to retry on your payload, then you have a problem. You don't want to do it yourself. So in the system that I have built, definitely, yes, it did it a lot. Retry some very specific reasons, uh, you know, shutting down and starting cluster from the scratch, especially in the, in, in the when they have you know, all these clusters, ephemeral clusters that we can use. So the answer is yes, and, I, and this is something that we, you can actually, you know, as, that, as that engineer, I encourage you to do, because we need to automate all these processes. And there's always unique situations inside your organization that you have to handle yourself. I, I would like to sneak my own question, uh, because there are a few more, but uh, uh, do you have a, a one simple example where the observability saved uh saved the day oh from your I, I have multiple examples that right now i will have a hard time to 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 find you know the best one or the top one it's like i think it starts you know i have i have experienced uh, cases then we were delivering data to our customers for months and we were filtering out some very important, uh, some very important information out of that data. And the answer was really simple. If it was, we could see in one place that the amount of data has been decreased, we have applied some, uh, some weird parameter 
inside the filter. So parameter has been changed, context has been changed, uh, data, no, so we, we, data has been changed, and there was a unique scenario when the, the unique scenario that we, it was hard to, to see it because the input size was just growing all the time. So it was really hard to see that the output sizes stay the same and it could save a lot of our time. So we spend a lot of time looking for this issue and it's actually could spend, uh, could save a lot of, well, I would say money <laughs> for the company uh, because we had to recalculate a lot of outputs and we just saw it was missed business opportunity. So this is, this is my story. <laughs> Okay. And I think uh, each of us will have a very similar story to share. So that's fantastic. So uh, the next one: uh, Do you perform an analysis on logs, or use logs for observability, or when one should use logs versus metrics? In, right now, when you run big data tools, the logs are first of all that big, right? When you run when you run Spark a few hours, the logs output is going to be big and log is uh, unstructured data, unstructured data, so it's really hard to get a really good insight from the log. So I definitely encourage, like, you know, everybody, everybody start from, not starting from the, not, do not, not start from the logs, but start from metrics. Metrics are much more descriptive information that you can use and it's, it's great. At the same time, logs really contains good information when it comes to the failures. So being able to scrap the you know, to go through the log, extract all exceptions, connect it to the Spark job that we were running, bring all this information all together, metrics, all exceptions that happen inside the Spark job, and present it to the user, it can reduce the cycle of failure response um, by you know, by multiple times. So it's a, it's a good question. Yeah. And uh, another one, how do you report the source data size to Grafana? Is it through custom operators via Airflow or is it via native StatsD wrapper in Airflow or, a, or another way? Yeah, so native StatsD system inside Airflow, I think right now, on my, again, in my opinion, it should be used only for oper like, uh, operational information for, mm -hmm. of Airflow. And again, as I said, maybe it will be, someday it will be replaced by Prometheus in the uh, uh, So it's uh, all this information coming from custom operators. All this information coming from the payload that you run. And this is something that we provide, or I, I do like a more like as an infrastructure to all users, to machine learning guys, to data science guys, to data analysts, so they can easily report uh, good quality information, interesting information, interesting metrics into the system of record, into the main dashboard, and then it can be used by everybody. Okay. Uh, another one. How do you combine uh, observability and blackout? And blackout. Um, what is blackout? Hmm. Uh, I think oh, I, <laughs> I can guess what is blackout. You know, like it's personal. Sometimes you have blackout. You see this, you see the pipeline. But you have seen you know, many times and then it's failing and you have no idea why it's failing. So <laughs> I can call this one as a blackout. But at the same time, you know, I think blackout is also can relate to you know, like a complete shutdown of the system, right? And everything is down. When you have a Black Friday coming and you have a blackout <laughs> and nothing works, right? So I think the really good use of observability is being able to prevent these situations. Being able to to be you know, to, 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 to come you know, to the really critical phase of this data in the execution with all tools, with the good knowledge, what's happening inside the pipelines, being able to run your pipelines with different data, being able to run your pipelines with different errors, like you know, input errors, like you know, like you know, uh, failing pipelines on purpose, being able to run your pipelines with different amount of data. So then the moment will come, you will have a good understanding of what's going to happen when you have a huge change in the input size or a huge change in the partner number or something like that. And I think observability is the part of this way. It's a important one. And I think, uh, again, myself, for, my, for, for, for me, I think I always start from observability. So. Okay. 
there is an ex explanation. Black hole means infra maintenance or known issue on external system. Okay, interesting. <laughs> uh, there's always something to learn. Uh, uh, ah, it's. I think it's. It's a question on the question. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so I don't. I, I actually don't know. It's a, maybe so they offer the dead question. They can, can provide an answer. Uh, <laughs> But uh, yes, we just, this is, we just discussed. It can be infra maintenance, right? Infra maintenance uh, on purpose or not on purpose. And it can be a known issue on external system. Again, when they have a good visibility on our own system, we also know what to expect from external systems as well. 